Hi, everybody. I'm Margo Ewan. I'm the executive director of the James Dempsey Foundation. We were started after the kidnap and murder of American freelance journalist James W. Foley while he was reporting on the conflict in Syria. We advocate for the freedom of all American hostages and held abroad, and we do promote uh, safety education through preventive uh, training uh, and uh, making sure that journalists are staying safe around the world with these resources, particularly our curriculum for uh, students of journalism at the undergrad and graduate level. Uh, so today's discussion is really super important to us um, about what it's like reporting as a journalist of color, why we need to add safety to the conversations that we're having about diversity in our newsrooms. Um, we feel that it's missing from typical conversations about diversity, uh, the fact that uh, journalists of color are more frequently and personally targeted than their non-Hispanic white colleagues. And the lack of representation in newsrooms has consequences on how management handles safety preparedness and psychosocial care after journalists are exposed to race-related trauma. So today we're gonna talk about how action can be taken now to increase diversity in the newsroom while also addressing these issues of safety and self-care for journalists of color. I do wanna just say that some issues we talk about today may be triggering for some viewers as our speakers talk about their own personal experiences of trauma. Um, so we just want to give a little warning there. Um, but it is my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We have Michelle Yehi Lee, a national political accountability reporter with the Washington Post and president of the Asian American Journalists Association. Uh, Lou Ortiz, uh, executive director of VitaActiva.org. Kathleen McElroy, director of the School of Journalism and Media at the University of Texas at Austin. Thomas Durkin, education program director at the James W. Foley Legacy Foundation. And Ron Smith, who will be leading the panel today, an editor and project director of the Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service. Thank you all so much. Looking forward to hearing your conversation. All right, well, thank you so much. And I'm really appreciative of this panel. And we're just gonna have a free forming, a free form kind of conversation. And it is a conversation. And so we invite the audience that's watching to chime in and their comments, and we're just gonna begin. Um, if I were to write an SEO headline about our session, it would focus on three things, journalists of color, diversity, and safety. So I think it's important that we begin with defining what we mean by diversity. And so I'm gonna open that up to the panel right now. What do we mean when we talk about diversity? What are we talking about today? Anybody? Kathleen, you want to start? Oh, okay. Um, I usually, <laughs> I talk too much, so I've been trying to restrain myself. You know, um, you can fill in the blank with other words for this, but what we're talking about is, um, and to me in this case, is the person who is not a cis white male, um, probably a person who's, um, whose identity is usually not considered privileged. Um, and we're talking about um, not so much, I would say diversity of thought, I worry less about that, but we're talking about identities and groups um, that usually are not seen or represented in media in ways they can control. How's that? That is perfect. Anyone else wanna weigh in? Or are we good with that definition? We're good. All right. So my second question, just to begin, is, um, you know, we are talking about health, safety, diversity amid a pandemic, amid racial reckoning, not only in our newsrooms, but outside the newsroom. But I would posit that this is not something that's new. 50 years ago, more than 15 years ago, the Kerner Commission issued a report that chastised the media for not uh, portraying and contributing to the lack of understanding about communities of color. In addition, what was then the American Society of News Editors, uh, newspaper editors, they issued a challenge that newsrooms would be uh, on parity in terms of racial representation by 2020. And guess what? It's 2020. So when we talk about the issues of diversity, 
I'm, I'm curious to see what the panel thinks. Is this a moment or is this a movement? I'd like to challenge your first observation, Ron, and saying that sure. maybe we might it might appear as the that the phenomenon is not new, but the circumstances and the context are very important to be taken into consideration. It will never diminish the amount of effort and then the amount of challenges that people of color have faced in the United States and around the world for many, many years, and the bigotry that especially journalists of color face. But what the, the, the storm that the pandemic, as well as racist injustice, as well as state-sponsored violence and police brutality against journalists conjures is very, very particular. And we need to be very specific about that. A great point, Lou. You want to uh, expand a little bit more? What do you see as the, the differences? What do you want to, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I would probably point out three or four things, and I would just pass the pass the baton to my to my uh, panel, fellow panelists because this is something we can build together. But I would say definitely the presence of the internet and the acceleration of the new cycle makes uh, makes small phenomenon bigger, make tragedies horrendous, and also the response, especially by our leaders through the same channels, make uh, make truth very questionable and difficult to trace and to identify. That would be one. And the second thing that I would probably say is different is the fact that news media outlets are suffering tremendously in economic terms. Mm -hmm. And so there is this very difficult dance between remaining uh, permanent and also being able to be financially stable. And those are factors that are also getting the uh, equation of how much or how little people react to the specificity of the crisis. I don't know what everybody else thinks. Well, I would also jump in here um, to say that, you know, this really is a moment where all of us in, across this country are just so fed up and tired of the systemic inequities in, in many ways. We're seeing this in the way our communities are being affected by the pandemic, um, the way that our communities are affected by uh, racial injustice and, and the ways that our the systems in our society have perpetuated these injustices and inequities. And, and you're seeing this also carry out in newsrooms as well. This moment of journalists, especially journalists of color, just speaking out and, and seeking the allies who are in our leadership who can actually advocate for us. This is also a lot of journalists of color just being tired of the way the status quo has been and the way our institutions have furthered inequities within our own newsrooms. Um, Ron, as you mentioned, you know, the higher up we get in journalism, the more white and the more male it gets. And that means the rank and file employees who are out there um, covering the news directly, being very online in the way they cover the news, really steeped in the pains of society right now, Many of us are journalists of color. Many of us are not cis white men. And that means we sometimes have a hard time seeing ourselves being reflected in leadership because we don't see enough of us in leadership and we don't always know who's gonna be advocating for us on our behalf. And it also makes it more difficult for journalists of color who are in the rank and file to advocate for ourselves because we're the ones who have the most to lose. We're the ones whose contracts are being reviewed by the higher ups. We're the ones who are freelancers, um, made a lot of early career journalists. And if you start to think about the power dynamics that exist here because of the years long failure within our own industry to elevate journalists of colors into the highest uh, forms of leadership within the industry, then you can start to see why there is this outpouring of frustrations and just fed upness with um, the lack of diversity within news. Great. Kathleen, what do you think? Well, you know, it's interesting that you brought up the Kerner Commission because I think the chapter on journalists is the only chapter journalists ever read or paid attention to. Um, and I, I bring that up because what um, Michelle and Lou are also pointing to is that at the time there were a handful of journalists of color in newsrooms and they had no say about the conversation. I think what has changed, what is good, is that now there are enough of us to say, hey, you're writing that opinion piece it is dangerous for us. This affects our safety, as we saw happen in the New York Times newsroom, that there are enough journalists of color to say safety is an issue and the diversity is more about 
is more than just numbers. Michelle has spoken eloquently about, you know, situations that we find ourselves in. And it's not just, you know, it's sending somebody out to the same, covering the same type of protests or being put in a dangerous situation. So what I am happy about is that there are enough of us to say, and there are enough organizations that can raise their hands and say, hey, wait a second, something needs to change in newsrooms. This is great. Do you all think safety has been left out of that conversation explicitly or implicitly? Or do you feel like it's just part of that conversation when we talk about diversity? I think it needs to be a greater part of the conversation. I think the reason it's not safety has not been as much of a part of the conversation as it has been. It, I do believe it's a reflection of the fact that we lack diversity and diversity mindedness among the leadership who do make the editorial decisions, decide who to deploy to which stories and how to treat their staff as they cover those stories. I think that's why we're not hearing enough about safety right now. And, and that's why I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, I'm the current president of the Asian American Journalist Association. And I can tell you that it's been a difficult year to be um, an Asian American journalist uh, around you know, China virus, quote unquote, the attacks on Asian Americans for just being Asian Americans. Um, it's been a tough time for us to just step outside of our apartments with our mask on because that could open us to attacks. And that means when we're on the job, um, many of our members have expressed a lot of fear because they have been targeted um, with racial hate when they're on like a stand up shot uh, covering uh, any other news just in their own communities. And the fact that they don't know exactly how to raise this to their supervisors, we've been hearing this concern a lot. Um, many of our members have asked AJ for resources on how they could actually talk to their supervisors about their fear, legitimate fear about doing their work without being seen as a journalist who can't handle it, um, without seen as a being seen as a journalist who is fearful of doing their job. And these types of conversations are so important. And the reason they're not being held enough is that there are not enough managers who think to ask that of their employees. That's a great point. Lou? Maybe chiming into, into the great point and the great points Michelle just made, uh, from the perspective of safety within the newsroom, uh, there is also something to take into consideration, and that is the harassment, the workplace harassment, as well as sexual harassment that women and LGBTIQ journalists experience, as well as journalists of color in the newsroom. I mean, the enemy can also be within. And this conversation not only has to do with what, we, what happens or what we do outside, but also what we do inside and also online. And, uh, and these are times where the conversation doesn't take into consideration that developing a thick skin uh, is not lo no longer part of uh, enough to deal with the violence that we experience as journalists. Uh, just quickly to say, safety for journalists doesn't have to be an HR situation or an HR event or discussion. It has to be a newsroom culture change discussion. Wonderful. So how do we make that a newsroom conversation? How do we embed that? It's not happening now, or maybe it's not happening as fast as we would want it to, but how do we, how do we make this go forward, right? Because it's one thing to, as we talk as journalists, to talk about a situation, we're trying to also offer solutions. So how do we, how do we get past this? Well, anyway. I, know, I know one thing that um, Thomas and I are working on is training our future journalists that safety is an important part of your reporter's toolkit, your notebook, that to be safe <laughs> mentally, emotionally, and physically is part of your training. Um, so we're, we are hoping that we can help young journalists survive in the newsroom culture that is not conducive for journalists of color and women. Um, it were, and you know, other groups that have been historically underrepresented in newsrooms. So we're hoping that these journalists will understand what their safety is all about. And as they move up, and we want them to move up in newsrooms, that they will remember this and they will make it part of their newsroom culture. Great. Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about the safety curriculum and how that helps? Right. And building on uh, what Kathleen just said, and going back to a conversation we were having yesterday uh, with Michelle, it's cis white males 
our part of this conversation and the and the and the fact that we can advocate, we can listen, but what the safety modules want are trying to do is teach our next generation uh, of journalists. Like, how do you create a a healthy, safe newsroom? How do you support um, all journalists? And particularly since we know journalists of color and female journalists are targeted in ways that their their white male colleagues are not. How do we support them? How do we make it a safe environment for everyone? So as Kathleen saying, we want young journalists growing up with this mindset that this is part of their toolkit. This is part of, of being a, a, a safe, uh, effective journalist. Great. But what do we do, guys, for the people who are doing the work right now? You know, before, I, you, before you move on to all of that, dear friends, it has to do with hiring. We need to hire more people of color. We need for this to be not a minority issue. There needs to be more people of color in, in, the, in the training programs at schools. We need to be able to have more people of color in general so that we are able to provide our own perspective. Sorry to interrupt you there, but it's just higher, higher, higher. That's where it goes. <laughs> well, you know what, Lou? I might disagree with you on one point because it's not just bodies. Because if those bodies represent the same mindset, if you know, then we really don't have a change in culture. We have a change in the look of the people who are doing it, but the culture hasn't changed. And I even see there's a question, how do you get managers to recognize safety being an issue? So any manager who doesn't recognize that now is not a good manager. And this is something that we're doing at um, with the press forward universities like University of Texas and other universities are saying we need more effective ethical leadership in newsrooms. So it is safety, it's diversity, it's embracing technology and understanding product and creating newsrooms for the decade that we're in and not built on some 1950s, 60s model. Yeah, and I would also add that, you know, this is a time for white male managers, especially, but just managers who are not um, journalists of color who have not been steeped into these conversations to start getting involved in these conversations for too long. Uh, people who are not white, people who are not male have had these conversations our whole lives. You know, this has been like in my text chains, in my Facebook groups, like these are all the conversations that uh, journals of color have all the time together, but it's time for it to the onus to be shared by more people than the, the same circle of journalists of color. It's time for um, especially cis white male managers to look within and, and, and learn and take that opportunity to reach out for help in understanding. There is this idea, there's a very real um, idea actually, a, a concept of us sharing uh, this, doing this uh, uh, invisible work of advocating mm -hmm. for journalists of color, the journals of colors uh, taking on that um, onus for ourselves. And it's time for that onus to be shared. You know, I can tell you that in my personal career, I have really benefited from um, white male managers who have cared and have been very diversity minded and have been careful to recruit and mentor journalists of color who are up and coming because they care about diversifying news. And that really matters. And it's time for more of that to take place. How do we do it, guys? I'm, I'm listening to and agreeing with everything everyone is saying, but feel like there's a couple of things that I've heard. One is that we need good managers. Often in our industry, we promote people and we don't give them any management training. Yes. Right? They, they get into a position and they might have been a great reporter and all of a sudden she's a city editor. Two, um, we talk about you know hiring more people at a time when the newsrooms are kind of imploding, right? We're seeing a rise of nonprofit journalism, um, but we're also seeing, you know, fur furlough, furloughs, layoffs, and all the like. And so the capacity to do that is not always what it was, say, 50 years ago. So what are things that we can tell our audience? Like how do we how do we go from crawling to walking to running? So one of the things I would say is that journalism is a business. Yes, I know it's in the only industry mentioned in the Bill of Rights, but it is a business. So we need to treat newsrooms as safe workplaces. 
it is time to think of the newsroom as a place where you can work safely. So I see there's a question about how do you protect young journalists from being taken advantage of? We're creating a case study for female uh, women um, who want to go into sports reporting. And we're saying, these are the questions you should be asking of a newsroom that wants to hire you. And don't be afraid to walk away from that place if they can't guarantee your safety, that they have online harassment guidelines, and that harassment is not your problem, it is the media outlet's problem. And maybe, even, and maybe even so, not only shifting the blame, but I would, I, I might say something controversial here. It is time for us to be radically sincere. It is important to be able to tell, and I'm taking the question on, how do we get cis, cis white staffers and managers and colleagues to recognize the safety issues? But by saying that, it is important for us to be able to feel safe, respected, and also empowered enough to be able to say, that is not okay, that is not okay, this is not how it should be, this is what I want to do. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, without being, being afraid of the repercussions or the blowback also of being able to say, I am not comfortable with you joking about me mentioning my body or sending me to cover the Latino story because I'm Latina. No, Lou is absolutely right. And, absolutely. and I see in the, in the comments that there is the invisible tax that Michelle was talking about. It's not that invisible, right? That you're t telling someone that I'm exhausted by the very work that you're putting me into that you, or you are hurting, you're affecting my safety, my physical and emotional safety. That's hard because all of a sudden you're weak right? The newsroom manager sees you as weak. And I think Michelle used this expression, you know, you have to have a tough skin. And we've got to change that. And again, I know it's hard for this to happen in current newsrooms. Um, but this is why we are, this is why, at, especially at the university level, we're looking at the young journalists and smaller newsrooms. We think nonprofit newsrooms need this training as much as anybody too. You got that right. Yeah, I mean, um, and this is also where organizations like AAJA and of course the National Association of Black Journalists, uh, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, Native American Journalists, I could really cite all of our organizations right now, but this is why we are, um, play such a critical role, especially in moments like these to really push our industry to uh, a place that we haven't gone before. You know, it's it really is easy to tell when you have people in charge who don't truly care about diversity. I mean, you can pay all the lip service you want, but it, it's really obvious when you care and it's obvious when you don't really care and you're just saying it for the sake of it. And um, organizations like ours are here to really be um, both a supporting mechanism as well as an accountability mechanism to hold users accountable for the types of hiring practices and the way they're treating their employees and the way they're recruiting future journalists into their organizations and also uh, provide support for the employees who want to be able to speak up. Um, this year, we've actually been helping uh, employees in different newsrooms speak up uh, for each other and for journalists of colors within that uh, news organization. AJ, NABJ, NAHJ have uh, recently, we penned a letter uh, that was supporting journalists of color within one specific news organization. And we almost acted as like an ombudsman for the journalists of color in that news org um, to help them speak up for themselves. And these are ways that um, we could really provide that blanket of support for employees, as well as holding newsrooms accountable to make sure that there are, the, that the newsrooms know that there are groups out here watching them and supporting them, but also making sure that they are um, providing the help that their employees need, especially during this time. You know, Michelle, it's really fantastic to hear you say that because one of the main, in the canon of uh, denouncing injustice, it's very important to never do it alone because then you will be signaled and if you don't have enough allies or if you're not in a position of stability, 
you will be the one who definitely would take the blame on many things. So it's important to be to find an ally in your newsroom, to find your organization, to be next to people, and and, and never never go at it alone without the proper homework done and the and the documentation. It's it's important to be able to do that uh, to protect yourself. And you know, if I could build on what. Um, Lou and Michelle, and I'm sure Thomas would agree, is that maybe all these organizations can create an almost guideline for newsroom management and safety. Um, because I know a lot of managers don't know how to do this. Goodness knows, I didn't know how to do this when I was a newsroom manager. So maybe this is an opportunity for the organizations to just give something that could be as simple as an infographic. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And I also noticed someone said, how can, uh, wrote in the comments, how can a person walk away from a job opportunity when there are so few opportunities? I don't want to put my young journalists in situations that could be dangerous for them, that are not good situations. And if the situation, I don't, it's almost as if they're better off not being in this business if this business can't protect them. Yes, I'm going to go there and say that. But I'm also saying that they can ask these questions and maybe the answer for a small organization that hasn't thought about this is like, wow, we hadn't thought about that. You know what? We're going to think about it now. And if you are in these situations, we're going to protect you. So we're not saying that everybody has to have an answer now, but if we can get newsrooms to start thinking about these issues, then that is a giant stride forward. There, there's also, um, the Foley Foundation is part of uh, ACOS, which is a culture of safety alliance. And uh, it brings groups together from across, around the world. Um, and they do do editor training. So there are, there are things available um, to help newsrooms at, uh, today, um, besides just mm -hmm. student journalists. So if you guys could give be Dear Abby or whoever you want to be and give advice to a newsroom manager right now that's watching, that's going to listen, what would you tell them? I would say don't be afraid to ask how your journalists feel. Don't be afraid to say, I know I haven't lived your life. Tell me how this makes you feel. And don't be afraid to get training from the Foley Foundation, from what we're coming up with ethical newsroom management. Um, just don't be afraid to ask. Think about building a better newsroom the way you think about content. You know, ask a lot of questions. Yeah, and I would add on to that and just remind them that they are in a position of such power and influence in a way that so many of us are looking to them just to take leadership of this moment. And that this moment is not just on journalists of color to do something or for us to speak louder, it's also on them, regardless of what their life experience has been, regardless of what their experience in the newsroom has been, to recognize the immense power that they hold right now and to do something responsible with it because this is a moment where we could actually push our industry into the next 50 years of real change instead of having to quote the same Kerner Commission report over and over again for another 50 years. Like we're all tired of that, right? And so, you know, I would tell these news managers, please know that you have so much power and know that there are so many of us who want to help you succeed in this moment. There are groups like AAJ and ABJ and AHJ and, and many of us, um, as well as the Foley Foundation, who are all committed to helping you succeed for your newsroom, which could also improve our entire industry. And we're all here and we have been doing the work and we are eager to expand the number of partners that we've had over the past decades so that more people can join in this effort to really diversify and, and bring safety to all of our jur journalists in this entire industry. And, uh, and be able to lead with empathy. It is mm -hmm. very important to consider like the way they tell us when we used to fly on planes, when there is not enough oxygen in the cabin, the mask will come. And what do you do? You put it on and then you put on to others. So lead with empathy, be mindful of your mental health. 
if you consider that you're str that, that you're struggling seek help and then be empathic with others these are times that are diminishing our capabilities of even having rational thoughts there is so much going on and in the position of power that you have and with the openness of being able to ask for support you are the cornerstone of um, allowing the possibility for people to be vulnerable with you and that's the moment when you generate specific long-lasting change and even if i might say in a journalism panel beautiful and precious and honest work which is what we're all trying to do in the end of the day you know if i could build on what lou was just saying you know, with organizations like the Foley Foundation, the Press Forward, AAJA, NABJ, all the organizations, and I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't name them all. If you want better content, create a better newsroom, mm -hmm. create a safer newsroom, create a newsroom where everybody feels valued and everybody can thrive and everybody has a voice. I'm not saying everybody's at the table, but everybody has a voice. And I, I would just, the, the one thing I would add is when you're news, especially for uh, newsroom managers, if we're looking at this, like how we're doing this panel virtually and how things are shifting very fast. And it's the younger people that have a greater grasp of, of what's going on right now, I believe, and they should be listened to. And that, so that would tie into younger journalists, journalists of color, female journalists, but they, I think newsroom managers need to listen to that and respect that this, this change is happening quickly. And th these are the voices that need to be listened to. So leadership is not always telling people to do, it's listening to what needs to be done. I mean, this is this is all great. I love you guys. <laughs> I would I would add just from my experience, you know, you know, nothing is you know. There's some things that are just a slam dunk easy. I've been a proponent of diversity for a long time, and now I run a nonprofit newsroom, and I had to face those same issues. I could have gotten someone who had this great resume, had all these wonderful ideas, as opposed to uh, a young lady who knew the community and how to work that I knew would take more work. So it's always an investment in your time and what you think is important. But I would say that one thing that newsrooms always want to do, we want to win Pulitzers, we like to win awards and we make up our mind and do those things, we do them, right? Um, so I just think that's important. I also wonder, since we talked from managers, what advice would you give to, let's give you three groups, students coming out, people who are in their jobs now, and those who are doing the work like you, Michelle, Lou, um, who might need, you know, you're doing the work and you might need a mental health break. What advice do we have for those three groups? Just take, let's take the student coming out. Uh, what would you tell them? Th Thomas, you wanna take that one first? Uh, in terms of uh, self-care, that's it's one of the things we really focus on in, in the safety modules. And this idea that uh, you are uh, able to file a story and then just walk away and it's not part of you, uh, it's I, I believe and I think most people agree, it's a myth. That story is part of you. You need to uh, recognize that you're impacted by the stories you, you cover. And it's all right to say, I need a break. And it's all right to check in on yourself. And one of the things we stress is checking on your colleagues. If you know that they've covered a, 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 a tough story, ask how they're doing. Sometimes people just need that outlet. And it's not, a, it is in no way a sign of weakness to be impacted. We're, we're, we're living through a pandemic. I mean, every everyone's dealing with a lot of stresses on top of whatever stories you might be covering. So I, I, I we just strongly stress that it, you need to check in on yourself and your, your colleagues. And um, I would add to that, um, and this is, a, again, the, the beauty of student chapters of these national organizations, is that you can have a built-in network. If you're in Milwaukee and you remember somebody you met in San Antonio, maybe you have a conversation. Are we feeling the same thing? Um, you know, the young journalists know what they're getting into even more than people my age. They know this is a disrupted industry. 
They know there's all of this. Their parents didn't want them to major in journalism and they're doing it anyway. <laughs> so you've got to really respect the young people who want to go into newsrooms. And I think managers need to see that, that these are tough people who have fought for the right to be in your newsroom, all right? So they've already overcome three or four hurdles. Don't add any more. And um, I see someone asked, are there more diverse students coming into journalism? We're seeing this because they want to make a difference. They don't like way, they don't like the way the world is going. And that's not even in a political sense, because this was happened long before Trump got elected. This is just young people seeing journalism as a way to tell stories that haven't been told. Yeah, and I would also build on um, what you guys just said um, and tell young journalists as well as working journalists that they are really in a working during a time of a lot of shifts within our industry, such as having conversations about mental health. Like when I started in journalism, I didn't know that I could even talk about this stuff with let alone my colleagues, certainly with my supervisors. And so I think um, it's important to recognize that we are in a moment where newsrooms are starting to head this way more and more and to take advantage of that and really band together and, and request and seek and demand resources from your company. If your company has a news guild, if you have some sort of a union uh, effort uh, within your newsroom, lean on them to push for more mental health services, to push for more support, especially during this extremely isolating and exhausting time. Um, the Washington Post Guild has been really advocating for more mental health services for, from the company and has been very successful in um, obtaining that. And I think that's a good model for for other newsrooms to uh, take on as well. And I think there's also power during this moment um, in a very digital uh, journalism space for up and coming journalists to really own their own voice online and, and build their own audiences around themselves too. Like I'm seeing a lot of young journalists within AJA who have their own newsletters and their own following and they really own their own niche topic and are building communities around that coverage area. And, if, and I really think that that's you know, moving forward coming into a newsroom with your own audience, with your own community of people who have respected and followed your journalism for a couple of years before you're hired, that's huge leverage to bring to any hiring conversation. And I think it's really smart what I'm seeing younger journalists do right now, just really taking advantage of the digital communities that they're creating on their own. I would probably segue what you're saying, Michelle, and bring it to people who are currently employed and, 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 and elevate what everybody has been chiming in. Uh, I would say that two things. On the one hand, we shall not normalize what is not normal. And uh, normal with a small n, I don't believe in the normal with a capital one, but normal as in what happens every day. Let's not normalize violence. Let's not normalize the precariousness of our jobs. Let's not normalize the furloughs. Let's not normalize the overtime. Or let's not normalize excellence in exchange for mental health. That on, the one, that on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is super important for us to be able to find and to strive, strive for a work and life balance. Most of us are working from home. Uh, the newsroom as we knew it is no longer, and I don't know when it will be the way it used to be. So we need to be able to find the limits define those limits, respect those limits, and begin caring for ourselves in the longer term. You're not only a journalist today. We want you to be a journalist until the day that you retire. You're planning for 30 more years of that, or this, that today you can no longer tolerate. So how are you going to find that balance? How are you going to fight for the balance? How are you going to include wellness as well as good, good, uh, digital practices, as well as good personal and mental hygiene. All of those things are so, so important. Oh, good. Anyone want to take this question that's in the chat? Um, well, there are a couple. There's one about, um, you know, the diversity quota the issue. diversity quota. It's a that's good one. Why, you know what? It's a classic, and again, this is a management newsroom. This is a culture. This is a journalism culture issue. And that's why we're 
you know, hammering on trying to change the culture of newsrooms, that there is a culture, there is a thing, and we need to change that. And I would almost, I wish we could call a summit of all the leadership. Um, but I also noticed someone put in in the chat about where we, what are the resources? We've mentioned the Foley Foundation. The Press Forward is working with Pointer on sexual harassment training. And they're also working with the University of Texas at Austin on ethical newsroom leadership. Um, Lou, tell us about your organization. Well, Vita Activa is a helpline. We mm -hmm. work with, uh, with journalists who are uh, experiencing violence online and they're experiencing the trauma, the burnout or the exhaustion that is related to their work. Uh, and I've worked very closely with the Knight Center for the Journalism, mm -hmm. the Americas as well. They have a phenomenal series of MOOC trainings uh, we developed, for instance, with Chicas Poderosas early this year, a leadership training uh, for women in Spanish uh, that had the perspective of empathy and the perspective of building through your own narrative. You just got to do the homework and look for those resources. Because in the end of the day, um, you will find somebody to help you. You will find it. Can I can I say one, one thing? This is to, somewhat separate, like because I know people have talked about like walking away from job, like how do you walk away from a job and things like that. I know newsrooms are contracting, um, but there is still there are organizations that are investing heavily in journalists, particularly young journal journalists. And if I can give a plug for one that we work with, uh, it would be Report for America, which is does one or two year internships, paid uh, internships, uh, like fully paid. Uh, that I would recommend young journalists look into. There are still places to go uh, if you're if you're looking for for work or different experiences. I also think you know, just like we would never be passive in trying to find a story and sources, go out there and look. There's the News Leaders Association. There are all the groups that we mentioned. Everyone's doing a little bit of something, but really, I think everyone needs to take personal responsibility because one of the things we always talk about is diversity. What we often also don't talk about is inclusion. It doesn't matter if you bring in these great journalists of color or people who don't look like you or act like you if you don't listen to their voices. So it's on everyone to do that. And with that, I'm going to toss it to Marco. You're on mute. Sorry, guys. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for this amazing conversation that I'm really sorry to have to cut short um, because I would love to talk about this all day. You all have such amazing perspectives. I would encourage everybody to take, check out the resources that have been shared um, for everyone's organization, um, including the Foley Foundation's journalism safety curricula. So you can visit www.jamesfoleyfoundation.org. Um, I'd also encourage you if you feel like getting active um, on October 17th, we're doing a, an all virtual 5K freedom run walk, the James Foley Freedom Run that you can participate from anywhere in the world. And that's at www.foleyrun.org. And I just wanna thank everybody for tuning in and to our wonderful speakers for taking the time today to talk about what they've gone through and share such great advice. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Thank you. And thanks, ONA.